<laughs> no, I'm not. Okay, so tonight's topic is three persons, two powers, one God, which is um, we're going to discuss a little bit about the doctrine of the Trinity in the context of the Old Testament. It's going to be a bit more of a chill meeting. Um, I, I gave this presentation once before. It was a fire hose of information. I've trimmed it down substantially. So we're just going to walk through one case study um, and make sure that everybody understands. But there's also 75 appendix slides. So if we want to keep going, there's plenty, plenty to go there. Okay, so why is this important? Well, first, the doctrine of the Trinity is a pretty central doctrine for uh, the universal church. Does anyone want to offer a definition of what the doctrine of the Trinity is? Anybody? Yeah, three and one, yeah. Okay. Does anyone disagree with that assessment that it's pretty central, pretty important? Yeah, so I have here, this is uh, a copy of the Nicene Creed with several of the uh, members of the First Ecumenical Council. Um, this, the question of the relationship of Jesus to the Father, which by extension is Jesus and God, was the earliest and probably the most serious controversy for the church uh, and resulted in a formulation of the Nicene Creed, which states we believe in one God. Um, I don't remember the whole thing, but anyway, but it defines the Son as, one, as being consubstantial with the Father, right? Being of one substance with the Father. Not similar, not a created being, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the Nicene Creed is the primary demarcation line between Orthodox Christianity, and basically everybody else. So 99%, I believe, Christians believe this, something like that. Uh, and a lot of times when people say Christians can't agree on anything, you can just point to this and say this is what we all kind of agree on. But the important part here, or the, the sort of um, um, interesting bi biographical fact for you that some of you may already know is that I was not raised Trinitarian. I was in that 0.001% that thought that that was a bunch of hokum. I was a member of, I was raised, and my family is still uh, largely members of what's called the United Pentecostal Church International. Has anyone heard of this? Cool. Is anyone a member? No, just kidding. I'll get you. No. Um, if you are not familiar with the UPCI, uh, they, well, first of all, they're Pentecostal. So if you're familiar with Pentecostalism broadly, they accept a lot of those standard things, speaking in tongues, uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit, things like that. They're also part of the holiness movement. We can talk about their place in North American history uh, and all of that, but their central sort of defining uh, doctrine that sets them apart from the rest of the Pentecostal world and the rest of, dare I say, Christendom is that they deny the Trinity and say that there's only one God who is the Father, and the Father is Jesus, and there's no distinction between them, right? Um, and that's kind of like their central doctrine. Now, part of the reason why the stuff that we're going to talk about tonight is so important, or part of the reason that I'm very affected by this, is that there are several other uh, facets of the UPCI and that sort of branch of fundamentalism that I consider to be very harmful uh, and sort of, dare I say it, uh, traumatic uh, in some respects. Um, certain sort of controlling aspects, things like that. Um, a lot of psychological damage, I think. Um, and so part of the reason that, that I sort of uh, am invested in this is that because their denial of the Trinity is a central doctrine, a lot of the other stuff is downstream of that. And if you were here last week when Jeshua was here, one of the applications of apologetics, uh, and especially sort of detailed discussion of Old Testament obscure stuff, can sometimes be to deconstruct uh, false doctrines on which other doctrines are built. So I have here, this is a picture of me as a child being baptized into the UPCI. Um, and this is, uh, I was an eight-year-old child being told to, to speak in tongues at that point, um, which ultimately resulted in a lot of sort of emotional damage for me and took quite a bit of reworking and uh, uh, reconstructing my faith after that. So that's part of the reason why I have at least a personal stake uh, in this question. And so for me, I had several sort of dominoes that were falling on uh, why I should leave the UPCI, but the major issue for me ultimately was they're wrong about the oneness doctrine. And if they're wrong about the oneness doctrine, which is their defining distinctive doctrine, they're probably wrong about all the other stuff. And the central part for me was this right here. 
the problem of Jesus' prayers. Because remember, if they're going to say that Jesus is the Father, what do you do when Jesus says, Father, the hour has come, glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the world began? It's an awfully difficult thing to make sense of, right? Um, and so for me, the, when I read this passage and really let it sink in and really reflected on it, uh, it ultimately dislodged me from that sort of oneness belief, right? But there was a sort of nagging is, uh, issue for me, and it's a nagging issue for a lot of people, which is if God is this sort of Trinitarian being, he's one in three, right? Or three in one, I should say, rather. Three persons in one being. Shouldn't we kind of see that in the Old Testament? wouldn't we be a little surprised if God related to his people for thousands of years and then only with the advent of Jesus we get this huge mutation into this Trinitarian doctrine? Do any of you have that same sort of concern? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you're agreeing with it. You're agreeing with it, yes. Yeah, that's, that feels weird, right? And yet this was kind of how I thought about the doctrine that, oh, the guys in the Old Testament, they just believed in the one God. And then Jesus shows up and starts praying to the Father. And then it's like, oh, well, Jesus is God. We're all on the same page about that as a oneness person. But now we've got to make room for this prayer thing. But then I started thinking, wait a minute. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they didn't understand God in this way, did they? That would be a bit of a problem, right? And it's actually this intuition that is a sort of core argument for oneness theology. So this is David Bernard, who is one of the, um, he's easily the, the, mo the foremost defender of oneness theology in the 20th century. And um, what he treats the data of the New Testament as saying here is the issue, like with Jesus' prayers and all this other stuff, where Jesus walking around says, I'm God, but also there's the Father and all this stuff. He says here, the issue was whether early Christians could affirm the deity of Christ within the context of strict monotheism, uh, it's important, or whether Jewish monotheism needed to be modified to account for God's eminence in Christ. Now, what he says by strict monotheism here is, in the technical debate, what we would call Unitarianism. So we previously talked about Trinitarianism, where we have the three, but Unitarianism is that there's the one. But he uses the term strict monotheism. And importantly, notice here, he's saying, whether Jewish monotheism needs to be modified. So he's saying this is how Christian doctrine developed. And he's essentially making the argument here that this type of Trinitarianism or plurality within God was foreign to Jewish thought and to the New Testament author's rhetorical world more generally. Polytheism, we've heard of that. Ditheism, we've heard of that. But no example of the worship of two or more persons who had distinct identities, yet were one supreme God, okay? So his argument is Judaism, the Old Testament, is strict monotheism, by which we mean Unitarianism, and because there cannot be modification within that at all, we have no reason to go to Trinitarianism. We have to interpret everything in the New Testament in the light of Unitarianism or the fact that there is the one God. Make sense? You understand the, the structure of the argument? Okay. So, if he's true, so if this is right, then we have a, one of two problems here. If it's the case that the Old Testament developed, or if uh, the Old Testament doesn't have any of this uh, divine plurality, either A, uh, Dr. Bernard here is correct in saying we have to read the New Testament through the lens of the oneness, unity of God, or we, if, on the other hand, we want to say that it was Unitarian and Jesus changed all that, then we have the problem of was God deceiving his people? and saying, oh, I'm one person, and then suddenly Jesus shows up, and now he's two persons or three persons, right? So, ooh, what do we do? This is why Christians feel the need to go to the Old Testament and find some sort of justification for Trinitarianism. And I'm sure you've probably heard some good examples and some bad examples. But the good news is, is that this is false, is that there is divine plurality within the Old Testament. So this is Michael Heiser. I'm sure most of you probably are familiar with him. Um, and he uh, points out here that there are two Yahweh figures, Yahweh being the covenant God of, uh, or covenant, the, sorry, the name, the covenant name of the God of Israel, in the Old Testament. Judaism before the first century, 
uh, knew this. And that is why ancient Jewish theology once embraced the two Yahweh figures, or what is sometimes called the two powers theology. Okay? So he's essentially saying, no, you're wrong, Mr. Bernard. There was no strict monotheism in the way that you've defined it. It is, in fact, the case that in the Old Testament there were two Yahweh figures, and then later those um, later New Testament authors appropriated that, and then that later became the doctrine uh, of the Trinity. Okay? Makes sense? Have any of you heard this before? Have any of you not heard this before? Okay, all right, that's good. So, um, now, while I do consider Michael Heiser to be uh, infallible and inerrant and a prophet of God, I don't think uh, we're going to rest our entire case just on a quote from him, okay? So, there is an obscene amount of data for this, and what I'm going to do is just walk you through one small strand of the argument so that we understand this one really, really well. And then we can talk about the rest if you want. But if we get out early, we get out early, okay? So, key question here. Who brought the Israelites out of Egypt? That's the question. Would anyone like to uh, venture a guess? We talked about the Exodus earlier this semester. It's very important, right? Central defining event. So who, who, who brought the Israelites out of Egypt? Moses. Moses. Yes, Moses, Moses was appointed, yes. Appointed by Yahweh, yes. Very good. All right. Now, let's think about the Exodus story. All right, I'm sure... Most of you have heard of it. Has anyone not heard the Exodus story? Okay, all right, good. Now, how does the Exodus story start? It starts with the burning bush, right? So picture in your mind, Moses is talking to God in the burning bush. Got the picture in your head? Okay. What does it look like? Does it look something like this? I don't know if you can see the thing. This is from the Prince of Egypt. How many of you have a picture in your mind that looks something kind of like that? Yeah. Bush that's on fire. How many of you have a picture in your head that looks like this? Either of these. Do you see the man in the middle of the bush over here? And the man over here? Or like this, where this is Moses shielding his eyes? How many of you had that in your head? Mm, why not? Well, this is what the uh, text actually says. This is actually closer to what the text says. So I'm going to read for you here um, the full text. This is from Exodus chapter 3. And I have the, I'll use this picture here. So listen, okay? Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of Yahweh appeared to him in a flame of fire in the midst of the bush. Moses looked, and behold, the bush was burning, and yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when Yahweh saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. And he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet. The place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of uh, Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Okay? So our dramatis personae, we have the angel of Yahweh, Yahweh, Moses, and God. Now, who is who in this scenario? Well, the angel of Yahweh is clearly that guy. But when it says that Yahweh saw that Moses looked aside, who, what Who's, who is this? If this is the angel of Yahweh, it can't be Yahweh, can it? But then it says that God called to him from the midst of the bush, saying, Moses, Moses. Does this cause some cognitive, some of the cogs in the brain are not, not sure. this, is a, this is a weird passage, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is it. So what do you think of this? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Anybody else? David? Perhaps, yeah. That's a bit weird to say the angel of Yahweh is Yahweh, though. A bit odd. Yeah. Weird, though, right? So I think the key point is that this... Yeah, go, were you going to say something? Uh, what word is God there in verse 4? Uh, Elohim. Yeah. Yeah, so good note on that. So in the um, Old Testament... Hebrew, you have two names that are used for God, Elohim and Yahweh. So yeah. So some and sometimes they get thrown back and forth. This is an example of where they're just, yeah, they're they're equivocating. Okay. But yeah, but I think the, the key point here is that this is a, a passage that really starts to kind of make things weird if you're going to insist that there's a Unitarian understanding of God. Okay. So let's continue with this. So this was the initial uh, commissioning, right? Well then uh, on Mount Sinai, uh, I'll read again when uh, God is speaking with Moses. He says, Behold, I send an angel. So this is I, Yahweh, and I'm using an angel color-coded there in red. Uh, before you, so this is after the Exodus has happened, and now they're at Mount Sinai, and they're about to go into the land. Okay, forgot to set that. So behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Pay careful attention to him and obey his voice, do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. But if you carefully obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. And when my angel goes before you and brings you to the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and Jebusites, and I blot them out, you shall not bow down to their gods nor serve them, nor do as they do, but you shall utterly overthrow them and break their pillars in pieces." Okay, so that's weird. More of that strange element there. Uh, you'll see that Yahweh is here sort of, he's sending the angel out ahead of him, but then the angel is doing things that Yahweh is taking credit for, right? which is a bit peculiar. And there's also this odd line here, my name is in him. That's an odd phrase as well. And then notice that he's, given the authority to forgive sins, which is, throughout Scripture, explicitly something that only God can do. Okay. So, again, more weirdness, right? So now we come to the question, so who brought the Israelites out of Egypt? Well, if we look uh, in multiple places, as Ben talked about a few weeks ago, uh, throughout several strata in the Old Testament, we have this phrase, I am Yahweh who brought you up out uh, from the land of Egypt to be for you as God. So Yahweh clearly is the uh, agent responsible for this, okay? Uh, Deuter or, uh, in Deuteronomy 4, Moses says, uh, to you it was shown that, there might, uh, that you might know that Yahweh is God. There's no other God besides him. He brought you out of Egypt with his own presence and by his great strength. So here we see another weird thing. And I actually like this passage because it's saying uh, specifically, there is no other God beside Yahweh. It's being very specific about this. But then in the very sentence that's saying there is no other beside him, it introduces this distinction with his own presence, which, as we discussed, is embodied in that angel. Again, sort of that weirdness, right? But then we get another strange passage because in Judges chapter 2, this is after the children of Israel have come into uh, the land. In Judges chapter 2, we have this passage here where it says, that the angel of Yahweh went up from Gilgal to Bokan and said, I brought you up from Egypt into the land that I swore to your fathers, but you have not obeyed my voice. Here, he's not speaking, again, as a messenger, saying, I come on behalf of Yahweh to tell you this says the Lord, right? This is how a prophet would speak. He is individually himself saying, I did all of these things. So what do we think about that? Weird, right? Any questions? Okay. So basically what we've covered just from the Old Testament data is that we have 
two agents that are both named Yahweh, that are, that are distinct from one another, that are doing things and yet are personally separate from each other because one is sending the other and not sending the other as himself, but has sending another as not himself in the other way, and yet they are both taking the name of Yahweh. And so this is what we're seeing here is, if you're you know, looking at this through the lens of Christianity, through the lens of Trinitarianism, you see already the very seed form of what it is that we as Christians are articulating when we say we believe in one God in Trinity, Trinity in unity, neither confounding the essence nor, uh, uh, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the, uh, the essence, right? This is the same exact kind of weirdness we see in the New Testament when Jesus says, uh, no one has seen God, the only begotten God, he has made him known. Things like that, right? So, to tie a bow on all of this, here's, uh, you might think this is all interesting, but this, this is just sort of, you know, a retrojection or what have you, right? Um, but the final sort of interesting little dot to connect here is that in the epistle of Jude, he explicitly identifies this man as Jesus and says, I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. So now when we come back to our original question of who brought the Israelites out of Egypt, was it God? Yes. Was it the angel of God? Yes. Was it Jesus? Yes. So those are all those dots kind of connected. Now, in a note of intellectual honesty, I have to point out, this is, there's a little asterisk there, there are alternate, um, there are manuscripts that have different readings here. So some of them say the Lord or just say God. Um, the two major debate is, does it say, uh, does it say Jesus or, or not Jesus, whatever I don't know what I'm saying. Does it say Jesus or does it say the Lord? That's what the debate is over, right? And currently the critical position seems to be leaning towards it's probably Jesus. Like if you have the ESV uh, or the NRSV or uh, most uh, Bibles that are based on the critical reading, they're going to say Jesus. Um, some of the older ones will say Lord. So, But I don't want it to falsely say this is like a, there's no debate right there, right? Yes? So would they have, like, I guess, like, what's the, um, I don't know, are there any estimates on, like, uh, scribes who have the exact term, exact to get edited yeah. to be more comfortable reading? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 this is a great, yeah, great question. Yeah, so there are several different theories. So um, the, the general, uh, the general rule with textual criticism is that you tend to go with whatever the more difficult or weird reading is, and it's widely accepted that if you had read this passage and it just said the Lord brought them out of Israel, or sorry, out of Egypt, that wouldn't cause any problems. But if you're reading and it says Jesus brought them out of uh, uh, Egypt, that seems weird. Like that seems very jarring to say that. So a scribe might say, well, we don't really want to say Jesus, literally the man that was born of David and walking around. We might say the Son or the Lord, right? So one of the leading uh, theories is that the Christians were trying to make a distinction between uh, Jesus the, uh, in his incarnate life walking around, you know, from zero or you know, from 4 BC to 30 AD or whatever, uh, versus his pre-existent state. And if you're trying to reference him before he was incarnate, then you would use something like the Lord or uh, the Son, or something like that. And so that's why um, that would be there. The other argument is that Jude typically refers to Jesus as Christ Jesus. He doesn't, uh, again, it's a very, very small data set. Jude's like, I think, what, maybe 20 verses, 21 verses, so extremely small data set. But he refers to Jesus as Christ Jesus, never as just Jesus. So some people might think that's a little bit, maybe, maybe the original reading was the Lord and it was changed, but either way. Okay. So the conclusion here is that there is a divine plurality in uh, the Old Testament. And so here's how Heiser puts it. He says, the most familiar way to process the information that I just showed you, and again, this is just one thread that we've looked at, the question of who brought the Israelites out of Egypt, is to think about it the way um, that we talk about Jesus. Christians affirm that God is more than one person, but that each of those persons is the same in essence. This theology uh, did not originate in the New Testament. And, it, and by extension, did not uh, originate after the New Testament with pagan influences or anything like that. Okay, Now, I would not want to make such a conclusion based off of a single story like I've done, but I'd, I'm trying to be, I'm 
I have a lot more data if you want to go through it, but I think that this is like one very clear example. So let me pause here for questions, and if there aren't any more any questions, uh, I'm going to go through another example to sort of illustrate this. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Would would what now? Um, that is a good question. Uh, I don't think there's a distinction between those two, so I would say shale. Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Um. Oh yeah. No, I think that. Yeah. So in the context of Jude, uh, I think he's talking about. Um, heresies that are cropping up, and so I think he's just chiding his audience, like, you seem to have forgotten your orthodoxy. Um, but yeah. Yes? That's a very good question. Um, let me find a different slide for us to sort of hang out on. Here, I'm going to... Uh, I'm just going to back up to, uh, here we go. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we could just talk about stuff. That's fine. Um, yeah, so is believing in Trinity a salvation issue? Now, this for me is a deeply practical question on account of the fact that there are many of my family members that I love very dearly who explicitly reject this uh, as, a, as, a, um, uh, as a heresy, right? Um, and I think it gets broadly into the question of what do we mean like by salvation issues, you know? Uh, so I would say that whenever I've talked with my family members about this, which is not very often, right? Because we, we try not to talk about these things. Um, but whenever I have talked with them, what I've noticed that's kind of interesting is that it's very rare that they're rejecting the Trinity. They're usually rejecting a very weird, bizarre, bastardized version um, of the Trinity. Um, something that doesn't seem to map on to, to, to orthodoxy. Um, and that when pressed, to explain passages like who is Jesus praying to, start using something that's close to Trinitarian language. Uh, and in that case, I think that it's, um, in the factual case is that there are people who are much more of like latent Trinitarians than they realize if, if they start to think about it. Uh, on the other hand, when you talk to people who ostensibly say that they believe the Trinity and you press them on it and then they start espousing heresy, like your typical average uh, person who doesn't think about this stuff the way that we do because we're weird, Right, um, and starts explaining heresies like people in my own church that's confessionally reformed and clearly orthodox. Uh, then you have this question of like, well, you're saying the right words, but you don't seem to have like a grasp on the belief uh, proper. So I think that um, those types of questions get really deep in the weeds on what level. It gets to a broader question of like, what kind of correct beliefs do we need to have um, for salvation? How far, quote, unquote, off should we be? What is God really looking at? Things like that. But when it comes to, like, the defining doctrine, like, I feel very confident in saying that, yes, like, Trinitarian, Trinitarian doctrine is sort of essential to the internal logic of Christianity. And if you don't have uh, some version of Trinitarianism there, you can't make sense of other very central doctrines, including uh, God, uh, what, what Paul says, which is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. You can't make sense of that if you don't have some kind of doctrine of the Trinity underlying it or something kind of like that there. So I would say in that respect, it is, it is essential to Christianity to what degree a person needs to consciously understand it is a more complicated question. But I don't think that, like the one this Pentecostal church, like I feel pretty confident saying like I, don't, I wouldn't consider them like Christians in the traditional definitional sense of the word, but yeah. Yeah, Grant, I think you were going to say something. Okay, David? Does uh, either the Old Testament or the New Testament treat uh, rejection of Trinitarianism as a heresy? You know, like in particular, for me. Uh, what are, hold on, say that again? What are you asking? Does either the Old Testament or the New Testament treat anti-Trinitarianism? 
oh, well, I mean, it's not, the words Trinity is not in there, right? So it's going to be, it's talking about loyalty to God. Like the central aspect of the Old Testament is loyalty to Yahweh and all that. It's not like a, uh, it's not like a quiz on your metaphysical understanding of the nature of God, right? And the same thing with, um, uh, in the New Testament. It's not, you must confess that you believe in one God in Trinity and Trinity and unity. It's, you must confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father, right? Like, that's what you have to ultimately confess in that respect. What I'm saying is that when you start to press those statements for, uh, uh, like, for cogency or coherence, like, what does that actually mean? What does that metaphysically commit you to? Well, then you have to be committed to something like Trinitarianism. Like, you can't make sense of the statement, like I said earlier, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, or um, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Like, those are just statements from Paul. Uh, and what's interesting is when you read, like, for example, oneness scholars, as I've done, the way that they try to make sense of that ultimately starts robbing the sentence of any meaning. Like, in, in the case of, uh, especially in the case of, like, the prayers of Jesus, like, if you don't really believe Jesus was praying to intercede to the Father, then it's hard to understand how you have a cogent understanding of the atonement. So, does that get to what you're at? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, don't break his judgment just because he didn't do that. Mm-hmm. That has that, sure, you're right, that has a Trinitarian implication. Mm-hmm. Where, like, we're expected to at least hold some kind of joint stance with him. Yeah. Because we're taking the divine wrath. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Um, yeah, and, and that certainly seems to be the case. Like, in the other passage that, that I have we could talk about, uh, Gideon is visited by the angel of the Lord, and he treats it as if. He has seen God, and he takes very seriously uh, the claim, no man can see God and live, and so he's like, I'm going to die. And so God specifically has to tell him, you're not going to die, even though you have seen the angel of the Lord, yeah, in that respect. So, yeah. yeah. So what exactly do one of the apostles say about the Jesus prayers? It's, oh, yeah, it's a mess. Um, it's, uh, it's essentially... Uh, th- this is not too far off from a straw man, but it is a bit of a straw man. Uh, it's Jesus' human nature is praying to his divine nature. Yeah. So a little flip would be if you believe only in God the Father and that Jesus wasn't God, that would be monotheism. And is that what yeah. the Pharisees and Sadducees were trying to hold on? But why wouldn't they have a true power to do? Yeah, yeah. Jesus the same, yeah. So, yeah, this is a really good question. Yeah, so the first thing is that I think Jesus does claim to be the second power in heaven. That's, that, that was the terminology at the time of the Second Temple of Judaism, was the two powers in heaven. So I think that Jesus explicitly claims this multiple times, um, and that's part of why they grab rocks to stone him. Most famously in John... He says, I am. Everyone knows that when they pick up rocks to stone him. In John 10, he says, uh, you know, the, uh, the scripture says, uh, I have said you are God, sons of the most high, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of that discourse, they pick up rocks to stone him. And if you read that discourse in light of uh, the two powers uh, theology, Jesus is essentially claiming, I am the second power, the son of man figure who is judging the divine council. Is like more or less what he's saying. Um, he also claims this in... Mark 14 at the trial uh, before Caiaphas, right? He says, I am the son of man, and you will see the son of man on the clouds of glory. And they, he rips his um, uh, tunic and says, the blasphemy, right? So I think that like what, it, what's happening there is they are mad at him and angry at him, specifically because he is claiming to be God in this second power sense. Now, the question is, why do Jews today not believe this, right? And what happens is there's really, really fascinating history about the history of Judaism after 70 AD, um, because Judaism prior to that was defined by the temple, right? Like, this is why 70 AD is such a big deal. Um, the sacrifices and all that business was super, you know, super important. 70 AD, the Romans come in, they level the temple. They also, uh, after Simon by Bar- uh, Bar- they, like, have this huge um, uh, scorched earth policy through Judea. It's a mess. So how does Judaism persist with no temple, no homeland, None of that, right? 
And so that's when you get the rise of uh, rabbinic thought after that. Um, and what's interesting is that you have a sort of co-evolution because the Christians, like nascent, you know, Christianity and Judaism were originally one group, and then they kind of were mad at each other because they're like, this guy's the Messiah. No, he's not the Messiah. And they were mad. The temple gets destroyed, right? Well, then they kind of start parting further and further from each other and doing their own thing. Um, and part of doing their own thing involved changing their theology uh, significantly. And so specifically, the two big things were the Christians were constantly having this argument with the Jews saying, Jesus is the second power. You know, you know all about all this stuff. He's the guy in Zechariah that's doing all this stuff, blah, 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 right? Uh, that was the first thing they were doing. And the second thing they were doing was proving it from the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And so these two things made the rabbis really, really mad and basically said, well, we're not going to do any of the Septuagint nonsense. So that is now banned. You cannot use Septuagint, Hebrew only. Uh, and this two power business is a heresy. There is only one God who is one person. There's none of this two power, whatever. Um, and that was a development like in 200 or 300 years after Christ. This is documented in uh, the book Borderlines by um, Daniel Boryarin, who talks about like, that's what he talks about, like what were the dividing lines between the Jews and the Christians. Uh, and also famously uh, in the 70s, there was a book called The Two Powers in Heaven by Alan Siegel, which talks about it. So, but the, the long and short of it is that like Judaism today is, I don't want to paint with too broad of a brush, but a lot of the doctrines were really set in stone like 300, 200 and 300 years after the fall of the temple. And what we're talking about is Old Testament theology, Second Temple Judaism, and that stuff, which is kind of like its own barrel of monkeys at that point. But yeah. So I guess this is a big thing in terms of observing and trying to do something like this historically focused thing or what have you. But um, I don't know, my, my understanding is that the two powers, like the, you know, the Greeks and the Romans and what have you, they still like, that wasn't like the, the main thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Well, I mean, the the most important thing from a Christian point of view is like, whatever minority positions were in Judaism that were accepted by Christianity or accepted by the early Christians, kind of formed the majority opinion within Christianity. Because, like, the doctrine of resurrection is a good example of this. That's a minority view within Judaism broadly. Well, it's a minority view on, like, a scholarship level. It's a majority view on a popular level, right? Because, like, the Pharisees believed in resurrection. The Sadducees didn't. But it's kind of like asking the, the experts versus asking the populace on that. But then in Christianity, that becomes, like, the defining part. So there's that, there's that kind of that factor as well. Now, when we're talking about sort of the two powers and Benetarian and all of that business is uh, this is something I was actually talking with Jeshua about because he's a, a more well-read in this than I am. Uh, about the time of the Second Temple uh, period, we had multiple different texts, Enoch being one of them, that have figures in them that are sort of like this weird divine vice regent. Uh, and they get identified with different people. So there were some streams that said that this divine vice regent in heaven uh, it's Adam, some said it's Enoch, some said it's Melchizedek. There's a lot of speculation that uh, was about uh, going on. Um, but the thing that I don't know, and actually I did ask Joshua and he didn't know this either, was like where the specific, this is, um, this is specifically like Yahweh himself uh, is, is this sort of second manifestation and all of the imagery that you see is uh, fitting under that umbrella. Like I don't know how popular that particular view was. Um, but the important part here is that all of it was based off of like reading the Old Testament. It, not even, it wasn't even like reading Pseudepigrapha or any of that business. It was like explicitly speculation based off of the passages that, that I showed you and some others from, from the prophets. So, yes? Do you think any of this had to do with uh, ancient Jewish cosmology? It was kind of this idea that God lives in heaven. Mm hmm. Yeah. Do you think this is able to answer that? Yeah, that's yeah, that's a good question. And this is actually something that uh the article I was quoting earlier from the from the oneness guy, um, that is kind of the direction that, that he goes, saying, How do you solve the problem of transcendence and imminence? God is transcendent, he's beyond everything, but he's also imminent in that he is sort of in everything. 
So how do you sort of you know, uh, square that circle? Um, and so there are some people that kind of go in that direction. It does, it, it, the, the part for me that seems kind of odd is that from what I understand from imminence, I don't think that the passages uh, that we've seen necessarily solve the imminence problem because then they just say that God is locally present in this particular person, right, who's physical and manifest here, right? No one would say that Jesus is imminent, right? Even if you accept that doctrine, you wouldn't say because Jesus is, in, uh, Jesus is the incarnate God, he's imminent, right? I don't know if I'm understanding you correctly there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, that, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, visible and invisible is the right terminology. The, the problem is what happens when the invisible and the visible start talking to each other. That's where it starts to get peculiar and weird. Um, and what happens when they start referring to each other in, with um, personalized indexicals, right? Like you, him, me, that kind of thing. In that respect. Okay. Good question. Then. Anybody else? Okay. We have a little bit of time, so I'm going to. I'd, oh, can I have a question? Yeah. Um, so, how did the oneness people um, interpret like eight hundred baptisms? Yeah, that's another. I mean, it's kind of a. I mean, again, I think it's a bit of a mess. Um, but the way that I was told growing up, and not even just growing up, like whenever I looked into this, the core argument always starts with, well, remember, these are monotheistic Jews that are watching this, and none of them started talking about the Trinity all of a sudden. So clearly they uh, were not phased by this, so it must have been some kind of modalism thing, right? Like some kind of uh, God manifesting himself all at the same time, right? Um, which again is... I, I think it's kind of gymnastics to say that because it, the, the text doesn't say, you know, the text specifically says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased, right? Again, personalized indexicals pointing to each other, relating to each other. It seems like, again, the problem with the, the prayers multiplied, so. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Um, I would be remiss if I did not read this last story here. So this is one other text. This is from Judges 6. Um, and... I only do this because I don't want you to think that the Exodus data is the only data. So there's like a ton of this stuff throughout the Old Testament once you start looking for it. Um, and these are essentially narratives where the angel of Yahweh shows up and then you can't tell if it's Yahweh or the angel of Yahweh or both or neither or who's talking. So I have here a picture. This is uh, Gideon over here being appeared to by the angel of Yahweh. I'm going to read the story and I want you to just keep track of who's talking and what's what. Okay. All right. So the angel of Yahweh appeared to Gideon and said to him, Yahweh is with you, mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, my lord, if Yahweh is with us, why then has all this evil happened to us? And Yahweh turned to him and said, Go uh, in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? And he uh, said to him, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And Yahweh said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. And Gideon said to him, If uh, now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. Please do not depart from here until I come to you and bring out my present and set it before you. And he said, I will stay till you return. And so Gideon uh, brought then to him under the terebinth and presented to him. And the angel of uh, Yahweh said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened cakes and put them on this rock and pour broth over them. And he did so. Then the angel of Yahweh reached out the tip of his staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened cakes. And fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes. And the angel of Yahweh vanished from his sight. Vanished. Okay. He vanished from his sight. Then Gideon perceived that he was an angel of Yahweh. And Gideon said, Alas, Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of Yahweh face to face. But Yahweh said to him, Peace be to you. Do not fear, for you shall not die. Now, who said that last sentence? Yeah, it's complicated, right? So the whole point of this is just to say, once you start looking for this, you find it all over the place. Here's just a couple. 
um, from Zechariah. Uh, Thus says Yahweh, uh, rejoice for I come and I will dwell with you and I will dwell in your midst and you shall know the Lord has sent me. That's a weird sentence. Yahweh saying the Lord has sent me to dwell with you. Genesis 19, Yahweh reigned upon Sodom and Gomorrah, fire from Yahweh out of heaven. Again, Hosea, I, Yahweh, will have mercy on the house of Judah. I, Yahweh, will save them by Yahweh. It's weird. And then Isaiah, just a fun one here, right, is Yahweh has sent me, uh, thus says the Lord, I should say, thus says the Lord, Yahweh has sent me and his spirit. Pretty weird. So if I were to summarize this, this may be a little bit anachronistic, but I would summarize it something kind of like this if I were were to put that into a graphic. So has anyone seen this graphic before? Yes. So I think that you start to see this kind of thing where you have Yahweh is not the angel of Yahweh, but is Yahweh, and then the spirit of Yahweh as well. Okay, cool. Um, So on your handout, I have listed for you several other... Uh, things if you're interested in this kind of stuff for you to go through. Where to go? Okay, there we go. So I've listed everything that I just talked with you about on the on the front page here, uh, and the main takeaway is just that Trinitarian theology often gets a bad rap as being sort of pagan philosophy tacked on after the fact, or it's some weird Christian New Testament thing that's been crammed into the Old Testament. But the main thing is that, as I've shown you here from a little bit of this data that the core pillars of Trinitarian theology really just come from the Old Testament, and it's just an outworking of that. Um, uh, And I have here a couple of other resources you can read uh, if you think I'm making this up. Most of this I pulled from The Unseen Realm by Michael Heiser, but there are tons and tons of studies on this. Um, On the back, I have a couple of other passages. I started to list all of them, and I got through, uh, what, about six, and they were all from Genesis. I was going in canonical order. Uh, and I got through six in Genesis. I'm like, you know what? I don't have time to put the rest, so that'll, that'll have to do. So, all right. Anyway, um, appreciate your time. Are there any other questions or comments or discussion or anything? No. Well, in that case, I'm going to do something extremely unprecedented and say we can leave nine minutes early. How about that? <laughs> Thank you so much.